Hello, my name is Mike Goldwyn and welcome to On The Mic. Don't forget if you haven't already followed us on YouTube forward slash Mike Goldman Live or you can watch every Sunday after 3 p.m. live on Facebook forward slash Mike Goldman Live and listen on Spotify and iTunes. Today, there's this amazing man sitting right next to me. Who is he? Well, he's quite often in the country brought out here by an incredible organization called Jack Grows. If you want to empower your life, you want to be the best person that you can possibly be, then go to jackgrows.com and Learn where you can meet these incredible people that they bring out from all over the world to help empower and inspire you for the best life that you could possibly live. Who is this guy next to me? You're probably wondering. Maybe you're thinking, I recognize his face from somewhere. Well, three facts about my guest to my right, to your left. <laughs> number one is he's written almost 40 books. Fact number two is this guy actually couldn't speak properly properly and had learning difficulties. <laughs> I can't speak properly as well. <laughs> had learning difficulties when he was a kid. He, he almost died and then he turned it all around after meeting someone to change his life completely. Fact number three, you might know him from the book and the movie The Secret. And fact number four, he is Dr. John D. Martini. Welcome to On The Mic. <laughs> Coming to you from Melbourne in his hotel room. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. Good to see you. Thank you. So last night we were here in Melbourne at the uh, Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre and a couple of weeks ago uh, I got to interview you on the show and decided to get you back on because you're so incredible and I just did this uh, amazing two-day course called the Breakthrough Experience which we're going to talk about at the end of the show but but first off I just wanted to uh, to say thank you for, for bringing me into your life and getting to meet you and teaching me all these amazing things. And, uh, and, and in this show, we're basically going to talk about you, your life, uh, what you're doing, the people that you're helping. And I also want to touch on some of the uh, amazing celebrities that you've worked with over the years. Uh, there's some PGA champions. There's some actors who you know weren't really sure where their career was going and the people that were in their life. And then all of a sudden, you've just helped them turn it around with your breakthrough experience. So uh, yeah, it's all really exciting. Thank you for, for having me. And um, I'm not sure where you want me to begin. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just bring this down here a little bit. Um, so uh, last night uh, you had a, uh, a talk about the alchemy of success and uh, you know turning things into gold, man. And I'm not just saying that because it's my name, but it's, it's true, that's what, what you're on about. What is the alchemy of success? Well, I think that everybody yearns and desires to do something extraordinary that makes a difference. They want to be loved and appreciated for who they are and they want to make a contribution and they want to do something that's meaningful and they want to be able to feel like they've done something that's unique and extraordinary. I, most people will, if I ask them how many of you want to make a difference, everybody puts a hand up. In fact, I was in a prison uh, not because I had done something, but I was speaking there. <laughs> You're in a prison. Okay. Yeah, on the front pages of the newspaper in Johannesburg, <laughs> it says De Martini returns to prison as a thing. But You're was, visiting your old mate Oscar Pistorius. Yes, actually, that's that's partly true. What? <laughs> but but at the same time, I uh, I I was actually going there to speak to 1,000 inmates. Yeah. Why? And, and wow. I had the opportunity to do that. And I the first question I asked them is, how many of you feel you want to make a difference in the world? And to everybody's surprise, the Al Jazeera television crew and the warden and everything else, every hand went up simultaneously, even in the prison. And this but, is a maximum that, security prison. That's crazy. Like, how would guys in prison think that they can change the world? Well, they, I mean, they, they, they just still had a desire first. to do it. And what they did is they felt unwisely mm. that the world was against them. And that's because they haven't known how to see things in a way, on the way, not in the way. But at the same time, inside, it's innate within us to want to make a contribution. It's just See part of our nature. On the way, not in the way. Yes. So on the way to changing the world, on the way, on the way to being successful. Well, if you if, see, it's not exactly what happens to you. I'm not a believer in a zeitgeist construct where the society determines your destiny. Yeah. I'm a believer that you have the ability to change your perceptions, change your decisions, and change your actions. So it's not, you know, people want to always blame things on the outside, be victims of their history instead of masters of their destiny. And as long as they have the perception that things are in the way, they'll hold them back. Mm. But if they start to ask a new set of questions, because the quality of your life is based on the quality of the questions you ask. Mm -hmm. If you ask questions, how specifically is this event, this experience, how is it helping me fulfill what's most meaningful to me? So you're saying that, that people have a perception of their life and that perception is from you know the, the, what they think is reality. But if they ask themselves a, a certain amount of, of questions, then it can help change their perception and alter their reality to live a more fulfilling well, life. Well, every week, you, you came to the Breakthrough Experience, yeah. and every week in the Breakthrough Experience, I ask people to find the most challenging 
situation they've ever had with an individual, somebody that they've resented or somebody that's really, they feel hurt by or something. Yeah. And I ask them, okay, define what are the highest priority things they've done that you have been despising, disliking, hating, avoiding the most. Yeah. And they write them down and they're really determined and believe that that's what was real. And then I ask him, all right, so where have you done that in your life? Mm. And to their surprise, they, they dig and they go, oh, I've done those things too. That and was crazy. And, and for me, uh, the person that I chose that really pissed me off, uh, you know, when, when I was a lot younger, uh, and I chose someone that really pissed me off because I thought it'd be easy to deal with, with the smaller things in life that weren't so bad. But when I asked myself that question, uh, when, it, when is it that I've done something exactly the same? I, had, I have more things that I'd done that were like that, or if not worse. Well, that's the thing. People, uh, what I discovered is that people, when they're judging somebody and judging events, it's reminding them of something they've done inside that they feel ashamed of, possibly. And as a result of it, this is bringing it up and it makes them want to avoid the person. And they don't like it because it makes them have to face parts of themselves they haven't really loved. And so when you go and you identify what it is that the person has done and then identify where you've done it, it softens some of the judgment on the person. Mm. It doesn't dissolve the, the overall judgment yet, but at least it softens it. Now once you ask, well, how did it serve you? Mm. At first they go, well, it didn't. And I go, yeah. I know. Yeah. That's, that's your first perception, but that's because you're unconscious of the upsides. Yeah. It's just like when you're infatuated with somebody, you're unconscious of the downsides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you're resentful to somebody, you're unconscious of the upsides. But eventually you discover them. So why wait for the wisdom of the ages with the aging process? Why yeah. not look now? So what I do is I make people look at that. And when they do, they discover that a lot of things that they're doing today that are extraordinary, that they are grateful for, were catalyzed by the experience that they had with that person, and they never put the two together. Yeah. And when they look at how that actually served them and benefited and advantages they got from it, the strength they got, the independence they got, mm. the drive they got, they actually get soft-hearted and they realize, I've never thanked this person for the contribution I made. I've been resenting them and thinking they were in the way when in fact they were on the way. So something you were talking about is uh, you know, thanking people who have been complete dicks in your life, and not necessarily going out of your way to ring them up if it's 10 years later saying, thank you for being a complete asshole. I hate you, but I just want to say thanks because it made me realize some things and made me learn some things. But once, I, th I can't remember exactly what you said, something about um, if you can't thank life for the experience, then it's going to be baggage. Well, anything that you can't be, anything you're not thankful for yeah. is going to occupy space and time in your mind. It's going to run you subconsciously. That's it. Until I was talking to a friend about that this morning because she constantly talked talks about and thinks about this guy still two years later yeah because she and, still and had the pieces baggage is, it needs she to has dissolved. infatuations with part of him and resentments on the other part and they're yeah. occupying her mind and she's attached to him mm. in buddhism they would call that the attachments yes. things you infatuate with or resent that yes. are attachments because they dominate your thinking is the, the buddhist thinking uh like I, i'm no expert with buddhism or anything like that but i've spoken to people who have been uh you know following that way of life or or reading uh books by the dalai lama and and the, it is the buddhist way of thinking like okay that's that person having their problems i'm not going to take it on board and just sort of let let them exist in their space because you know when you're having a fight with someone you love or care about and you sort of feel personally responsible for it and you take it on as something that you have to help them deal with and, and you take on that bad energy is is that what you're getting at by well it, it's anything that you perceive when you see something you see an event you see a behavior uh, if you're, you're filtering it through your own value system, mm. and that's your reality, 10 people could look at that same event and see it differently. Yeah. You're, if you're filtering it and you're labeling it something positive and attractive, it's because you're seeing more advantages and disadvantages. Mm. You're seeing more positives and negatives. You're seeing things that support more than challenge your values. But unconsciously, there's another part. Yeah. Just like when you're infatuated with somebody, you have an unconscious part that knows Something's missing here. I'm, I'm, uh, if I interview women who are really in fact with their guys um, or men, you'll find out that they intuitively know there's other sides and they're on the lookout for it, but they haven't seen it yet. But why sit there in part of an ignorant state when you could be looking and find that and balance the equation? Because mm -hmm. the price you pay for putting people on pedestals mm -hmm. is you'll sacrifice things that are important to you. Mm -hmm. You'll inject some of their values into your life and try to be somebody you're not and you'll lose your authenticity. Yeah. And that's a disempowered state. Yeah, why do people always look for the negative? 
in a situation well, rather, than, rather than focusing on the positive. Like uh, last night you were talking about a, uh, a model who was always seeing the, the uh, these other beautiful models online. This is one of the most amazing women in the world. I don't want to steal your story or anything like that. Yes, I'm going to steal your story. And, and she's been on the front cover of magazines and she's, she's you know, obviously doing quite well for herself, but she still felt ugly on the inside because she was looking at other girls Instagram profiles or other girls on magazine covers and she'd say oh that girl's got um, you know more fuller lips than me or that girl's got bigger breasts than me rather and I really got a lot from this rather than going oh she's like me she uh, is someone who enjoys herself and has a good time oh she's like me oh she's got the same beautiful blonde hair as me I wonder what shampoos she uses and and I think a lot of people don't change their thinking and that's something that I think would stop a lot of anxiety out there in the world when they start to focus on people being like them rather than what's different about them. Well, if if you the, the ancient Greeks said that if you see more similarities between you and them than mm. differences, you have infatuation. If you see more differences than similarities, you have resentment. But if you can see a balance of similarities and differences, you feel love. Mm. So when somebody's infatuated with somebody, they go, "Oh my God, we have the same number of eyes, the same number of ribs, the same number of teeth. We must be soulmates." <laughs> and they're in an enamored state, yeah. blind to the downsides yeah. and differences. But then when they're resenting the person, we don't have anything in common, we're going in two different directions, we can't see eye to eye, they're focusing on the differences. But when they can keep a nice balance, a, ba a, bar a kind of a bantering balance of support and challenge, positives and negatives, things that are similar and different, you feel a respect and a love for somebody. And, and mastering the ability to ask questions to keep yourself centered in relationship to people you care about is mastery. That's what I'm trying to teach people in the breaks experience to teach people how to ask new sets of questions to address the perceptions that they have that are imbalanced mm. and rebalance them so they're not run by the things around them that yeah. are misperceived, mm. but actually they can then love and appreciate the people because mm. once it's balanced, it's appreciated. Yeah. Mm. You love the so person. When, when uh, I did the Breakthrough Experience, which is a uh, two-day course, is a small group of people, and uh, you, you work through so many incredible things that I'm, I'm still getting from it. Um, some of the things like uh, learning your highest values, and there's a, gr a great way to, to figure that out on your on your website. Uh, where you, it, it's it's a brilliant system where you, you you line up all the things that you think about, the things that occupy, occupy your space, uh, the things that you talk about, and it, and it actually brings a lot of values. You probably in some cases, well, I, I didn't know that I actually had. Is that on uh, JackGrows.com or on the Demartini website? Well, that one's on uh, DrDemartini.com. Yeah. And the reason I put that together, I, I've been using that for many years, almost yeah. four decades. And I, because I, I found when if you ask somebody um, what it is that you value in life, what's important to your life, most people, because they compare themselves to other people yeah. that they have as hero figures, they inject these ideals and ideologies from other people. Mm. And they'll tell you things that they think it should be yeah. and what's expected from them, from the world around them that they admire instead of look at side of what their life actually demonstrates. Mm. I'm not really interested in what you fantasize about, I'm interested in what your life demonstrates, because mm. that's where you actually can identify what's really going to let you excel in life. Mm. And many people have this idea, you know, I'm into peace, I'm into integrity and yeah. truth, and all these idealisms. <laughs> and what their life is demonstrating yeah. is that they really love to, to go to work every day, yeah. and they work 12 hours a day, mm. and they like to build their wealth, or they like to take care of their kids, yeah. or, or whatever, and so I'm interested in what their life demonstrates. Because mm. whatever's intrinsic to you, that's mm. spontaneously acting from within, yeah. that's where we get the greatest authentic you. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm a researcher and teacher, I, I do it spontaneously. Yeah. I love learning and I love sharing. Yeah. So if I was to come up and say, well, my highest values are that my kids or my wife or this or that, I could say that. It might sound good, but it would be hypocrisy. Yeah. I'd rather be honest about who I am to myself, mm -hmm. and that way my expectations on myself mm -hmm. and other people's expectations can now be grounded. It's what inspires you and makes you want to jump out of bed in the morning and, yeah. and, and run off to work or you know, do your computer and start researching like you do and, and figure out the direction you want to go with. Um, so there'll be people watching this right now and they're probably thinking, okay, yeah, fair enough. I know what my highest priorities are. I know what I really want to do. You know, I want to be, uh, you know, writing for a surf magazine or I want to be a, you know, a, an actor. Like my, my uh, girlfriend, Bianca, she, uh, she's been studying acting her whole life and she came along to the Alchemy of, uh, of Achievement, Alchemy of Success presentation that you put on and something that she walked away with just like, a, a, this is just a two hour talk that Dr. Demartini uh, puts on with jackgrows.com. If you get the opportunity to go and check it out, it's amazing. And it's, uh, it's just sort of a toe in the water to the breakthrough experience, which 
has been incredible for me. She loved the whole linking thing, and because she hates going to work to work at a cafe like you know a lot of people who i know lived in hollywood when i was there they're doing these dead-end jobs that they hate but they're, they're can you just talk to us about the whole linking the the crappy jobs you don't want to want to do but you know that they're going to lead to something better yeah it's a very powerful exercise because we've been blessed to to bring it into major corporations and they've they've seen the result of this it's really powerful nobody goes to work for the sake of a company They go to work to fulfill what they value most. And if they perceive that the job duties and responsibilities that they're doing in part or whole is helping them fulfill what is really valuable to them, they become inspired to go to work. They're engaged. They become present. They don't think about breaks so much or getting away from it. They just get engaged in it and they get very productive. And they, they, the higher things are in people's value, the more they feel ownership because their identity revolves around their highest values. So they start to, if you ask them, they'll say, my company. But if you get somebody that's unengaged and they can't see what their duties are doing to help them fulfill what they value, they go, the company I work for. They'll talk in third person, not first person. So that has a major impact on whether or not you feel that the quality of your product is important for the world because it's your company. Mm. You know, people who have their own company treat it, their company differently than people that are just working for it. Mm. So by having them engage and by having them see how their job duties are helping them fulfill what's meaningful to them, the engagement level and the inspiration and productivity are definitely measurably going up. Mm-hmm. We've taken into companies and you can definitely see it. We have one of the largest Japanese companies, Uniqlo Corporation that manufactures clothes, mm-hmm. uh, went up $1.47 billion after implementing this in one wow, year. Wow, that's crazy. So, so what happened was uh, you asked the question, one of the greatest questions you can ask yourself if you're at work and you're not, maybe you're in transition about doing something you want to do, your own business. But right now you feel a bit trapped in this job that you're having to do as a transition. Make a list of everything you're doing in a day. Everything of the duties you do. Go online and do my value determination process. The, 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 it's 13 questions. It takes about 30 to 40 minutes. It's worth the time. Don't lie to yourself about the answers. Go truthfully about what your life demonstrates objectively on these questions how you fill your space most, what is the most important things you spend your time on, this kind of thing. Going through and asking those. Then once you do it, you'll summarize that and you'll get the top three values. Then go and take that job description and ask how specifically is doing this activity, even though it's temporary until you can delegate it, or even though it's temporary until you can go on with a new plan of opportunity to go to the new job, how is it helping me, one, in fulfilling my highest values, and how is it gonna help me in my next career path? my next step. If you answer that question, and don't lie saying it doesn't, and don't say, oh, I can't find it, just be accountable to answer that question. The more you make the links between what you're doing now and seeing how it's gonna help you get what you want in life, you're no longer victim of your environment, you're now making commands to your own perceptions and running your perceptions and seeing how it serves you. Once you do, you'll see that that's on the way, not in the way, your energy levels will go up, Your desire to actually produce and create goes up. You have a higher probability of getting opportunities out of that. You might all of a sudden see that the very people that you're interacting with may be helpful in your next step. They may be actually giving you leads that you never saw because you have been subjectively biased against the job. But by going in and finding out how each of those duties, maybe you have 30 activities you do in a day, every one of those, the time spent, I've seen people do this over a three hour period and their productivity soars enough to be able to have major companies utilize this as a way of inspiring engagement and productivity. But by doing that exercise, instead of bitching about your job and putting all that energy into running your system down, when you can see how your job duties are helping you fulfill what's valuable to you, the entire immune system rallies around you. Your cytokine inflammatory responses go down. You have used stress and adaptability and resilience, and you're able to see creatively, and you're starting to see that you're doing things that challenge you but inspire you because it's getting what you want, which is where creativity and productivity come from, and not dis-ease, you might say, because you're trying to avoid it, and it keeps having to be there because you're trapped. So take the time to ask new quality questions. How specifically is this job helping me fulfill what's most meaningful to me? I promise you it'll give you a release. It'll also give you insights on how to go to the next level. Definitely go and check it out, drdmartini.com. And, and, the, and the segment yeah. in, uh, on, there, on the menu, also, it's about to change. The yeah. website's about okay. to change. But drdmartini.com mm. and the value determination or determining your values, it'll be under that topic.
Mm. Take the time to do it. We've had thousands and thousands of people do this and they've been very grateful for it. So once you've done that, uh, something else which I love that you talked about at the Breakthrough Experience and you, you've kind of touched on it in the, uh, in the alchemy of success, alchemy of achievement, is uh, owning the traits of the greats. And that's about you know someone you aspire to be or look up to or someone that that is doing you know, has already done the same career path that, that you've done. They've already paved the way to success. Just owning their traits. Can, can you talk about some of the uh, the people that you've worked with? I know you've worked with some actors and you've worked some, with some sports stars. How it's worked for them and what owning the traits of the greats is all about. Well, <clears throat> anytime you meet somebody that you perceive as being more intelligent more successful, wealthier, more stable in relationship, <clears throat> or maybe having a more attractive spouse, more socially savvy or better leaders. Somehow you might think that they are more attractive or more healthy, or maybe more inspired and more spiritually aware. Anytime you compare yourself to them and assume that they have something you don't, you'll tend to minimize yourself or be intimidated by that and you'll exaggerate them subjectively with a bias and minimize you subjectively with a disconfirmation bias. You'll minimize you. This self-depreciation, you mentioned the lady that had the yeah. beauty. Yeah. She was doing that because she had 17 supermodels that she was sometimes on the runway with and she kept comparing herself to parts of them, not all of them, just parts of them that excelled. And if you look at that same supermodel, I've gotten to work with a number of supermodels. Yeah. And I'm amazed at how many of them have self-depreciation on their looks. Yeah, Amazing. Really? Because they keep comparing themselves to these ideals. Yeah. It's kind of their job, though, because they, you know, they have to make sure that they're in, in tip-top condition. Yeah, they and and every, day, every day they get, they're getting knockbacks. I mean, it's like being an actor or a voiceover artist or exactly. TV host or whatever. you you got to go to an audition and, you know, every week and, and someone's going to say, no, we don't want you. And you're going to think, oh, it might be because, you know, I, I'm a bit fat here or, you know, my, my face doesn't look right or, you know, maybe I, I said the wrong things so you, you're going to be yeah you sort of constantly have to be like this that, this is this is a this is a thing that, that a lot of people face even mm. the fear of public speaking is not the fear of speaking mm. we speak one-on-one -on -one with people all the time yeah but the second you're in front of it i, I had a, a gentleman that had a fear of public speaking and i asked him to imagine himself speaking in front of a kindergarten class and he goes okay mm. you got any problem with that nope uh first grade nope second i went right up the grades mm. He got into high school, still no problem. The second he got to college, which is the level of education he completed. Right. The second he got there, he started having anxiety. And the second I put professors and people that were more knowledgeable than him on his topic, the moment he all of a sudden froze. Is that, is that because he's worried about what people think? Because he's comparing himself to somebody else. And anytime you're acting like an authority in front of somebody that you think has more authority to you, you end up with, withdraw. Yeah, and that fear comes up. Because a lot of times when I speak to people uh, who you know, want a bit of advice about you know, how to get up on stage and and you know not not stress so much about the audience and not not get nervous, um, I always think about from when I was a kid and because I've sort of grown up in the industry, so it's probably hard for me to to freak out about getting up on stage and probably hard for me to relate. But I give them a few ideas like saying, you know, think of everyone in the crowd in the nude or, you know, think of everyone out there as your best friends and you're at a party or get drunk. No, I don't say that. But is, is there is there certain Those things? Those are that, all helpful yeah. because now you're leveling the playing field. Yeah. It's, That's it's, it. You've got to level the playing field. It's subordination mm. to the person that does it. Yeah. So because of that, we tend to shrink mm. instead of shine. Yeah. We gravitate instead of radiate. Yeah. The moment we exaggerate them and minimize ourselves. Yeah, because I um, probably one of the things that worked best for me when uh, you know I was on stage hosting a show and you know millions of people watching, and I was I was freaking out because I'm thinking I could stuff this up, which I did many a, a time in a good way, and it ended up being funny. Luckily, um, I uh, asked my dad, I said, "Hey, well, you know what's the best way to handle this?" And he said, "You know what? You just have to think. You do not care what anyone out there thinks." You're there for yourself, and you're there to have a good time. You're there to do a good performance, and if that, and and you're never going to have everyone love you, and that's something that you you have to come to terms with. I think working in the entertainment industry, or in life, it, because you can never, ever, ever satisfy everyone. Well, I learned a long time ago. There's in society, there's complementation of opposite mm. values. Yeah. So there are some people that are like and dislike you, support and challenge you. That's normal. That's what love is, as mm. I've described. So whenever I see somebody who's a skeptic in my class, yeah. instead of sitting there and trying to change that person, there's nothing to fix, mm. I go to the gullible person 
who's all enamored. Hmm. And I go and I challenge them and the skeptic comes online. Once ah, I challenge okay. the gullible, yeah. the skeptic softens. The skeptic is there to compensate for the gullibles that aren't really thinking and just exaggerating me. So anytime somebody exaggerates me, I get people that have put me down to keep me centered. Mm. Otherwise, I'm not authentic. And there's actually a mechanism in society that help people be authentic. Mm. So if I get a skeptic, instead of sitting there defending that and f feeling the, the pride and how good I am, mm. wiser to just go and have confrontation and calm down the infatuation mm. with the, the gullible. And the skeptic milds, turns mild. And I, once you understand that, it's actually a fun, it's a dance. Mm. Now, let me finish on this, um, on, on owning the traits of the greats. The second you see this person that's above you and you're below them, that means you're too humble to admit what you see in them is inside you. And that's like a cat expecting to swim like a fish, mm. as Einstein said, or a fish expecting to climb a tree like a cat. You're expecting to live in their values and not your own. And you'll excel in your own values, but you won't excel in theirs. Mm. So if you compare yourself to them, instead of compare your daily actions to your own priorities, you're guaranteed to have those intimidating factors. Mm. So in the breakthrough experience, I ask people to identify the highest priority traits that they admire most and the parts that they despise most, mm. the hero and the villain traits. Because you don't get, you know, people had this fantasy that Steve Jobs is more positives than negatives yeah, yeah. until they got to know the movie and see his book. And then you see he's a human being. Yeah, he is. And you, you, you can love a person yeah. who's a human being, but you can't really identify with yeah. a fantasy person. Yeah. Hero. What, what was interesting there in the breakthrough experience, I found when uh, you, you choose that person or that moment that really pissed you off. And then we talked about this earlier. You, you've, you write down all the times where you've been like that. And you, you sort of go, hang on a minute. That, that dissolves it and, and clears it out and gets it out of the way. Well, you realize it's level playing field. Yeah. You may still have a charge on that behavior, mm. and that's why I have to go to the next step mm. in the break, too. So once you identify this trait that you admire and despise, then you go and ask, where and when do I display and demonstrate this particular trait, this action, this inaction, to the same degree, quantitatively, qualitatively, until I level the playing field? Because as long as I'm too humble or too proud to admit what I see in others is inside me, I'm gonna either try to project my values on them and trying to get, get them to live in my values, which is futile, or I'm gonna to try to live in their values, which is futile. I can only live in mine, they can only live in theirs. Then once I do is I think if I admire this trait, what's the downside of the trait? See, we think this, that all traits are either good or bad, but this is very narrow-minded. If, you, if you've been in a relationship and you're a guy mm. and you see this really beautiful girl yeah. and she's a hot, mm -hmm. I mean, you got, her, you got her on a list of a 10, <laughs> and then you start dating her, it won't be long, weeks or so, mm. when all of a sudden you start to see that that very trait you admire also has downsides. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, you know, she's focused on herself, she yeah. takes forever in the bathroom, yeah. you know, takes it, she's self-absorbed, uh -huh. there's, there's, all the guys are after her. Yeah. There's something. Nobody's perfect. There, there, well, that, that, is, that is the thing. The perfection is not the one-sidedness that people think is. The perfection is the balance. Yeah. And if we don't see that balance, mm. we can't honor their magnificence. So what we do is we go in there and find out the downsides of the traits we admire and the upside to the traits we despise. Because the traits are neutral until somebody with a narrow mind labels them good or bad. Mm. Once they're balanced and you level the playing field, you're not intimidated by the person, you feel appreciation for the person. And I have a series of other questions that yeah. I ask to break the fantasies about it. But once you see that they're just human beings and they're living according to what their values are and they have been persistent in excelling at what they're doing, and there's no reason why you can't do the same. If you're willing to put in the same hours, you get the same result. Who's the person out there that you're talking to? Who do you think should do the breakthrough experience? Well, I don't know of anybody that can't take the principles of the breakthrough experience and add that to their repertoire and without gaining something and having an advantage in life. I've been blessed to have people that are very young in there that are young kids. Mm -hmm. I've had people that are up in their 80s. We had a 92-year-old in there in Perth, Australia, that was quite... 92? Uh, yeah, she was frisky. <laughs> wow, did she have a lot of baggage or she just didn't care because no, she was No, actually, old? she was brilliant. She yeah. was actually a really playful, uh, freed lady that had no... I mean, she didn't have any inhibition. She was really out there. And she was an inspiration to everybody in that room. I mean, I think at the end, people were applauding and thanking her for being in that program because they thought, wow, here's a person 92 years old that's still active, still engaged, still learning has goals, ambitions, can play with people, not stuck in her ways, just really an example of what's possible for people. It's very inspiring to have her there. That's amazing. Uh, lastly, uh, on owning the traits of the greats, I mentioned a couple of sports stars and the actor. Uh, do you just want to briefly touch on, on that and then we'll wrap it up? I, I think you, you... Yeah, we had, we had um, there's a lovely gentleman who's in London who I will see in a few days, actually. Yeah. 
Um, his name is Scott, Scott Cranfield, and he is a professional golf pro. And um, it, what he did is he had, he had, he was not at the very top level. He didn't have clients uh, that were at the very top level at the time when I met him. Yeah. But he came to the Breakthrough Experience. He came to my Prophecy One program, which is on leadership and self-mastery. Mm-hmm. He also came to a training program, which is the Demartini Method, the method on owning the traits of the greats. And there he decided he's going to make a concerted effort to incorporate owning the traits of the greats to the top golf pros. So what he did is he took the top seven golfers, I think legends, I mean, it was the Tiger Woods and it was, it was uh, Gary Player and Jack Nicklaus and, and Arnold Palmer and these people. He took the seven people, he went and researched their lives over the next six to seven weeks and identified the 25 behavioral traits that, that stood out that the people admired and he admired and disliked. Because sometimes they were ruthless at times. Yeah. And identified both sides of those. And then he took his top seven golf pros that were there that he was training that were listed in the around 312 to 324, around the 300 mark in overall golf pros in the world. Mm-hmm. So they weren't the very, very top tier at the time, but they were, they were good golfers. And what he did is he had them all, as an exercise, go in there and do owning the traits of the greats on those golf pros. And that was starting, he did six weeks, of, uh, he came to the training program in August, September. He did getting all the traits together and getting everything prepared for the guys by October, the last week in October. And then from last week in October, he did one line a day himself which is, it takes about an hour. And he spent that owning the traits of the greats and really doing this. Mm. And he started working through it. And from October, uh, the end of October, all the way to July that year, while they were working on this, they were just owning the traits and, and practicing. Now he was doing Making other things. Making it a habit, basically. He was doing it and doing a methodical, yeah. just a little bit each day, not overwhelming amount. And as you know, people will be a little bit more engaged or less engaged in the process. Yeah. But in July, um, the... Uh, British Open and the European Opens, uh, two of those seven won, got to the top. What? That's amazing. It was. How'd you feel? Well, you, I didn't you, know about you it You played first. a big part in that. Well, I didn't know anything about it yeah. uh, until I got an email mm. from Scott with the articles in the paper and the thank yous yeah. that they gave to him yeah. for, the, for making it possible. So good. And then they mentioned me in it. And then a, there's a gentleman named Eric Lang who is a movie producer in Hollywood area. Um, who was doing a movie on golfers yeah. and wanted to do uh, a, th- I think it was the 12 leading golf pros and 30 celebrity golf players, you know, movie stars, Samuel Jackson, these people that play yeah, golf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they wanted to film them on the spirit of golf. Yeah. And what does golf mean in the world? And what's the significance? Relaxing, you know, going out and having a hit with your friends. Well, it was more... Earning a shitload of money if you're good at it. Well, it's, it's, it's more than that. It's about what is really the meaning that golf has to these people. It's more of an inspirational... What exactly is this? What's the inner game of golf? Not so much what's the benefits of the winning golf, but what was the inner game that you have? What's the mindset? What's the what do you what inspires you to play golf? And so that was what the movie was about. And I got mm. to be participating and film for the movie, and also oh, wow, cool. so did um, Scott Cranfield. So that was an opportunity that came oh, because yeah. of that that tool. My dad told me that golf stands for gentlemen only, ladies forbidden. I don't okay. know if that's necessarily true. I don't. I don't know. It's, it's a I'm good one. Joking. I think there's women out there that are knocking that ball around pretty, pretty good too. I think that's a, a woman's game now too. That's great. Well, I mean, that's that's such an incredible story, and it's so inspiring. And and there's there's so many more. I, I could talk to you for for hours about. There's another uh, actress girl that you were talking about uh, who was in Die Hard, and uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to take up too much of your time because I know we, we've got another uh, interview just just about to come in. But thank you so much for being on the show again. And uh, thanks for allowing me the opportunity to come and work with you and, uh, and introduce you at the, uh, no, at the, I th- I the Martini shows around the country. I, I think it's my thank you, too. So yeah, I don't cool. think it's, it's, I think it's, it's a, yeah, there's equanimity there. So thank I'd, you. I'd really like to, because I have a film festival, Sanctuary Cove International Film Festival, and, you know, w- working in the TV industry, I, I, I think there is such an incredible science behind what you've created and the whole Martini method that, that you use in the breakthrough experience. And the science of, of the psychology that you use with people, helping them deal with grief and, and problems that they might have had in their relationships or the workplace is something that I think university professors need to take a really good look at. And I know that you've worked with some uh, universities in the past. And, and I, I just 
think that the, the whole, more of the world needs to know about this. And if you want to know more about it, you should definitely uh, look at when Dr. Martini is coming to a town near you very soon, uh, doing a, a talk on a, a wide variety of things. Uh, go to jackgrows.com or drdmartini.com and uh, make sure you have a go at that um, that, that amazing uh, questionnaire on there about your uh, your values because uh, it, it'll be the first step to changing your life or even if you don't want to change your life, you just want to make it better. Who doesn't want to make things better? Well, I, I believe that uh, deep inside, every one of us really do want to make a contribution. We do want to do something that we're inspired by and there's no reason why we can't. I'm a firm believer that it's not what you've been through or what you're going through or what you experience in life, it's what you decide to do with it. You know, you're, you are captain of your, your fate, if you will, and you have the capacity to transform any perception you have, any experience you have, and decisions you have, and go in a direction that's priority and is fulfilling. And so give yourself permission to do something extraordinary because uh, the true you is exactly that. Find the true you. What a great way to end. Thank you so much. Dr. John Martini. thank you for watching on the mic. Don't forget to subscribe on our YouTube channel. Check out Facebook every Sunday afternoon when we go live. Facebook and YouTube.com forward slash on the mic. And you can just listen on iTunes and Spotify if you like. Thanks for watching. Catch you later.